This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Tundras. Do you wish deserts were freezing cold? Try Tundras today. Welcome to episode 76 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. Today, we are talking about ice, the one thing that can sink the Titanic, but disintegrates within five minutes of touching a glass of Coke. Seriously, imagine if they made the Titanic out of Coke? The ice would melt and water it down so fast. Specifically, we're talking about ice sheets, or huge expanses of land ice that today cover most of Greenland and Antarctica. Given how prominent ice is in the climate conversation, and that the Sweaty Penguin is Antarctica's hottest podcast, I'm honestly kind of shocked it took this long for us to do an ice topic. At this rate, we were going to do an episode on Olivia Rodrigo's future second album before we talked ice. But actually, this is kind of perfect timing. For all of you who listen to our Tip of the Iceberg podcast, where I break down the big environmental news headlines, you know that just a few months ago, Antarctica had a major news story. Scientists are warning the world could be looking at trouble, big trouble, from a so-called doomsday glacier in just a few years. What they're seeing here is fracturing in the ice sheets surrounding it. Yeah, they're really worried that these sheets could shatter in the next three to five years, and that would really pose the biggest threat for sea level rise this century. This was the Thwaites Glacier news story. This glacier, which is the size of Florida, is being held back from the ocean by an ice shelf, and that ice shelf has started to crack. Scientists expect it will collapse within five years, and suddenly, a piece of ice the size of Florida falls into the ocean. I said back in December that the sea level rise from that glacier presented a worse-than-worst-case scenario. And yet somehow, Thwaites became known as the Doomsday Glacier. This local news story called it that on air. Several national news outlets called it that in their headlines, and I just don't know what to do with that, because unless you're referring to the DC Comics character, Doomsday technically means the last day of the Earth's existence, or close to it, colloquially. The release of Thwaites will cause massive damage across the entire planet, but it's not a mass extinction. The impacts will be gradual over the next century, and that gives us not a lot, but some time to adapt to them. I bring this up to say as we talk about ice sheets today, it's going to seem overwhelming. It's like when friends are coming over in 10 hours and you still have to vacuum. But we can handle this if we take it seriously. It's not doomsday. News stories like this one that suggest it is are a bit of an exaggeration, and I'm sure some people glean that on their own, but I don't want there to be confusion or unnecessary stress. But while Thwaites is the celebrity glacier at the moment, the entire Greenland and Antarctica ice sheets are melting fast. According to measurements from NASA satellites going back to 2002, These two ice sheets are losing 427 billion metric tons of ice per year. That's eight Olympic swimming pools every second. And today, we're going to explore how climate change plays into that melting, how it affects our oceans and sea levels, and where we go from here. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. If you want to take two minutes to help out The Sweaty Penguin, you can either leave us a five-star rating and review, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. Doing either earns you a special shout-out at the end of the show. Joining the Patreon gets you merch, bonus content, and a whole lot more, including an extended cut of today's episode. First, what is an ice sheet? 
An ice sheet is a mass of land ice extending more than 50,000 square kilometers, or 20,000 square miles, so anything bigger than the area of Costa Rica, or 3.8 million Costco's. Antarctica and Greenland are the Earth's only two ice sheets today, though there have been times in history, such as the Pleistocene Ice Ages, where much of the Northern Hemisphere was covered in ice sheets, presumably shaped just like a slide so the baby in Ice Age can quickly leave a room of spiky icicles. Now, the land ice that forms an ice sheet is not the same as sea ice. Sea ice is what might come to mind when you see those images of polar bears walking around ridiculously thin pieces of ice just dying to passive-aggressively sulk in front of a documentary crew. That ice is just frozen ocean water. It's not attached to land, it didn't come from land, it's just kind of floating around and melting very quickly, I might add. Land ice is the stuff covering Antarctica and Greenland. Each year, and you can even think through this if you live in a more temperate climate, snow falls in the winter and melts in the summer. In, say, New York, all the snow melts. It actually often melts throughout the winter when there's a random 85 degree day in January, as if the subways weren't sweaty enough. In, say, Minnesota, it's a little different. I took a look at some records, and it looks like there's snow on the ground for the entirety of the winter, especially if you go further north, but then come April, it will all melt. The snow melt catches up to the snow fall. That's why my mom, who grew up in Minnesota, always told me they just had two seasons, winter and road repair. If you go to Antarctica, the snow falls in the winter, but there, it doesn't all melt. Does some melt in the summer? Absolutely. But the snow fall exceeds the snow melt. The snow melt doesn't catch up. And that means year after year, layers of snow build and build and build. They start compacting onto each other like a really bland lasagna. And after thousands of years, you have a massive sheet of ice burying everything under it. Why is it land ice? Because under all those layers of ice, there is land, as well as a bunch of other cool stuff, which we'll discuss a bit in the interview later. But with a warming climate, all of that is changing. That ice that built up over thousands of years is now starting to melt away, faster than the snow can replenish it. For ice sheets, that happens in a few ways. There's surface melt, where ice turns to water, there's sublimation, where ice turns directly to water vapor without transitioning to water first. I know that sounds impossible since we don't normally see that happen, but if you want to do a little science experiment, hang a wet shirt outside in below freezing temperatures, and you'll see that the water will freeze, but the shirt will still dry in a few days. The ice will turn directly to water vapor. In all fairness, I haven't tried that myself, I just read it online, so it's very possible we're all about to get pranked. If Gaten Matarazzo is starting a new TV show called Podcast Pranks and we're about to be on it, it's an honor. And then by the ocean, you have melting from contact with warm ocean water, and you have calving. Which is not when men stare at themselves in the mirror while doing toe lifts at the gym, but when the ocean water disrupts a glacier or ice shelf and breaks off a chunk of it. By making air and water temperatures warmer, among other things, climate change is accelerating all four of these melting processes. Now, this is a topic where you might have heard some differing things. In particular, I saw a lot of mention of a 2015 NASA study on the internet used to say Antarctica is gaining ice, not losing it. Here's one YouTuber's take on the study. Unstoppable ice melt, you say? Now that sounds serious. Until you see that literally the very next year in 2015, they released the following. NASA study, mass gains in Antarctic ice sheet greater than losses. The ice caps were growing by tens of billions of tons of ice a year, according to NASA's own figures. But that didn't stop the scaremongering hogwash about how we need to blow up the economy to save the penguins. And some people might want to write this off right away, but let's think critically about this. Let's pretend 
pretend it's your crush saying hey and overanalyze it as much as we can. Climate change affects different parts of the world in different ways. In Greenland and West Antarctica, ice is melting fast. In East Antarctica, it's a little more nuanced. Again, there's snow falling, there's ice melting, and scientists have to figure out which is greater, the snowfall or the melting. There's a few ways scientists can do that, but for this study, they used lasers. For five years, they would use satellites to shoot laser beams at various spots on Antarctica and see how fast the beam popped back. And then they did the same thing on the Southern Ocean as a control. Now, which laser beam would we expect to pop back faster? The Antarctica one, right? That's because Antarctica is a higher elevation than the Southern Ocean, so the laser beam has less distance to travel. In fact, the higher the elevation, the faster the laser beam pops back. Make sense? Side note, imagine playing laser tag against Antarctica. Every time you shoot, it deflects the shot and hits you back. Why don't you stop melting and hit up some nine-year-old birthday parties, Antarctica? So that's what these NASA scientists did. They shot lasers from satellites for five years. And they found that Antarctica was gaining ice, particularly East Antarctica. This contradicted what scientists before them were seeing. They published their study and got almost as much media attention as Kyler Murray's agent. But after other scientists examined their work, they noticed a few issues. For the Southern Ocean to be a good control, it would have to be still water, which it isn't. And their measurements were assuming Antarctica's height consisted of mostly denser ice, whereas other scientists found it was actually lots of less dense snow. NASA has satellites where scientists can measure Antarctica's mass based on the degree to which Antarctica's gravitational force tugs at the satellite as it passes over. And we can see how that changes as ice melts or accumulates. So this isn't guesswork. They've been able to evaluate this, even if it's not as fun as lasers. Seriously, how are more kids not saying they want to be a glaciologist when they grow up? But several studies since 2015, including other NASA ones, found Antarctica was losing ice overall, including in East Antarctica. Now, the authors of the 2015 study aren't stupid or anything. This stuff is really hard. I'm sure if you gave me the laser, I'd aim it wrong and accidentally freak out some town in New Zealand. And even if their findings turned out wrong, the scientists never denied climate change. And I think it's a good thing they pushed the rest of the scientific community to develop a better understanding of Antarctic ice melt. That's why I wanted to actually take a moment to break that down. Because folks like the one in this clip pointing to a NASA study and saying that ice sheets aren't melting do sound very convincing. And I don't think they're purposely being deceptive. But if we're going to rely on one NASA study, we should really use their entire body of work. And when we do that, it's clear that the 2015 study had some issues and the rest of their work finds Antarctica to be shrinking. So we know the Antarctic ice sheet is shrinking, as well as Greenland's at an even faster rate. Why does that matter? For one, even if people don't live there besides scientists and a bearded Leonardo DiCaprio wearing a bear carcass, there are ecosystems on and surrounding ice sheets. A lot of the species you might immediately think of, such as polar bears, seals, and of course penguins, are actually much more affected by sea ice melting as opposed to land ice melting. So I'm going to save them for another time. Shocking as that may be for me to forego the chance to talk about penguins and why Happy Feet thought it was okay to have a male penguin say, let's talk about eggs, baby, to a female penguin in a kid's movie. I mean, what kind of pickup lines are you teaching these kids? If you were a vegetable, you'd be a cucumber. Still works, George Miller. In terms of animals... What the melt of land ice harms in a big way are nearby shellfish, such as crabs, clams, and scallops. 
Fortunately for Antarctic penguins, the krill they eat are not as susceptible to this. They're... krilling it. But for these other shellfish, they build their shells using calcium carbonate. And the fresh water that melts off of ice sheets contains lower levels of carbonate ions. When calcium carbonate isn't readily available, these shellfish species can really struggle. Listen to Bill Dewey of Taylor Shellfish, who experienced this firsthand. Part of that chemical reaction is it reduces the availability of carbonate ions, which are what the shellfish we grow build their shells out of. Oh. So they're struggling to build their shells. And we didn't understand this. It, you know, in the first 48 hours, all of our larvae were dead and laying on the bottom of the tank. We'd take them and look at them under our microscope and say, well, yep, they're dead, you know. Bill is in the Pacific Northwest, so the calcium carbonate shortage there is probably due to other factors. For example, some of the carbon dioxide we emit into the atmosphere gets absorbed by the ocean, and then undergoes chemical reactions with the carbonate ions and the water to form bicarbonate. I don't need to detail how that works, but what that means is carbonate ions are getting used up by CO2 and not having the chance to react with calcium to form the calcium carbonate needed by shellfish. More carbonate used by CO2, less used by calcium. Make sense? I know that's a little complicated, but it essentially means carbon emissions make it harder for shellfish to build their shells. It's worth noting, too, that colder water has the ability to absorb more CO2 than warmer water, so this process is magnified in the Arctic and Antarctic. Now that did it for Bill. So imagine adding to that meltwater from ice sheets that contains lower levels of carbonate ions than what's already there. You can see pretty quickly how that could dilute calcium carbonate even further and lead the crabs, clams, scallops, and other shellfish to really struggle. Deep sea corals off the coasts of Greenland and Antarctica need calcium carbonate to build their skeletons as well, and despite their pediatrician's best efforts, they refuse to drink a glass of milk every day to get it. That fresh water from the ice sheets also affects oceans more broadly. By diluting salt water with fresh water, the ocean water becomes less dense, leading to changing patterns of ocean currents affecting the saltiness of ocean water all over the world. Beyond cute animals and ocean salinity, a lot of the other impacts of ice melt that you might be familiar with, such as weather changes, shipwrecks and oil spills caused by new shipping routes, or the darkening of the Earth's surface, are all more related to sea ice, so I won't discuss them today. But sea ice can take all of that, because ice sheets are responsible for a big one, and one that sea ice actually has nothing to do with. Sea level rise. Think about it. Sea ice is like the ice cubes already in your glass of water. When they melt, they don't cause your glass of water to overflow because they were already there. The water level stays the same. Assuming you don't scoop out the ice cubes first, eat them, and say, I like ice, like a five-year-old who's three seconds away from brain freeze. But land ice is like dropping new ice cubes into your glass of water. It wasn't in the ocean before, but now it is. And when that gets dropped in and ultimately melts, that's when your glass of water overflows. That's when sea levels rise. In fact, a study from Nature last year found glacial ice melt to have driven 21% of global sea level rise over the last decade, second only to thermal expansion, where ocean water gets hotter and as a result takes up more space. Similar to how when you boil water on the stove, the water rises in the pot. Or when you go to sleep at night, if it's cold, you bundle up. If it's hot, you sprawl out like a starfish. No? Just me? For many people, sea level rise is already having disastrous consequences. Of course, we first think of island nations shrinking into the ocean, floods in Indonesia or Bangladesh, those images of Miami disappearing... But the impacts extend further back, 
and to more communities than one might expect. Here's Rutgers University's Dr. Robert Kopp on how 10 years ago, sea level rise was already hitting his state of New Jersey. So the largest impact we'll see um, in New Jersey from sea level rise is its effect on coastal storms. If you think about the amount of flooding caused by a storm, right, it starts at some base level, some average sea level. And if you raise that average sea level, you'll amplify the damage of the storm. During Superstorm Sandy, there were roughly 70 to 100,000 people who were exposed to flooding during the storm who wouldn't have been exposed had the sea level rise that occurred during the 20th century not happened. Dr. Kopp and his colleagues' findings are really noteworthy. Their article in Nature finds sea level rise led Hurricane Sandy to affect roughly 71,000 extra people and cost an extra $8.1 billion to clean up. Again, that's not the extra impact from climate change, that's just sea level rise, which is one of several factors that exacerbate hurricanes. Being from Connecticut originally and experiencing Hurricane Sandy as a kid, that really hits home for me. I think ice sheets, despite being widely talked about, can be one of the most challenging environmental issues to care about because they're so far away. So to hear from Dr. Kopp that we have concrete data showing how ice sheet melting affects our life really makes you turn your head. If you're in another coastal region and get hurricanes, you may be able to find these numbers for your community, and even if you aren't, you helped pay that extra $8.1 billion with your taxes. And while hurricanes, floods, and drowning cities are what might come to mind first when we think of sea level rise, the impacts extend much further. We've talked about this before, but just a few centimeters can cause destructive erosion, wetland flooding, aquifer and agricultural soil contamination with salt, and loss of habitat for many plants, birds, and fish. Keep in mind, these coastal ecosystems that would be affected are our mangroves, our reefs, our salt marshes, our seagrass meadows, some of the most important ecosystems in the ocean that don't contain a pineapple-shaped house and hyperactive talking sponge. These ecosystems store carbon, which helps the climate, they're home to many of our favorite ocean animals, and they actually help our economy in many ways. If you add up things like fisheries, ecosystem services, tourism, etc., Seagrass meadows are valued at $19,000 per hectare per year, and mangroves are valued at $12,000 to $50,000 per hectare per year, for example. When we consider that the Thwaites Glacier alone threatens to rise sea levels by a few feet, and these are the impacts of a few centimeters, you can see how this quickly becomes a major economic and environmental cost, and one that disproportionately affects low-income and minority communities. These communities disproportionately live in floodplains, live near brownfields that can dislodge toxic chemicals during a storm, and if you remember from our Tropical Cyclones episode, Black and Latino communities often don't receive help from the Federal Emergency Management Agency as quickly as neighboring white communities. So what are we supposed to do about all of this? First off, cutting greenhouse gas emissions and mitigating climate change is likely the most cost-effective option in the long term. We've talked in many, many episodes about various steps and challenges in that process, so I won't rehash it all right now. The other idea I've heard is to do some targeted solar geoengineering via aerosol spraying. Again, I suggest listening to our solar geoengineering and aerosol episodes from January, but basically, this would aim to cool Greenland or Antarctica by putting reflective particles in the atmosphere that block out some of the sunlight. Short term, that may actually be cost effective and fast, but that idea runs into a lot of barriers, from who's in charge, to what happens if you stop spraying aerosols, to a laundry list of possible unintended consequences. That's not to say it couldn't help, but it would need a lot of development and forethought. Unfortunately, neither of these solutions can solve the whole issue, though. It's like turning off the faucet when your bath overflowed, or admitting you hate Love is Blind when it's already greenlit for season 3. It stops the bleeding, but even if we mitigate climate change, even if the climate stabilizes as a result, 
were not stopping the Thwaites Glacier from falling into the ocean. And that's where we turn to adaptation, figuring out how to live in a world with a Florida-sized ice cube in the ocean. But to adapt to sea level rise, you have to ask a difficult question. Do we stay put and shield ourselves, or do we move? Obviously, moving lots of people to higher ground is a majorly difficult task, in large part because nobody wants to be told what to do, and that's completely reasonable, unless the thing you want to do is put mayonnaise on a hot dog. Don't do that. That's disgusting. And even if everyone wants to move, 40% of the world population lives within 100 kilometers of a coast. That's a lot of people to find new homes for. Even Josh Flagg couldn't pull that off. And I suspect that's why I more commonly hear about communities trying to shield themselves via seawalls, jetties, etc. That said, according to University of California Irvine's Dr. Eric Rignot, these strategies have their drawbacks as well. If you put a levy, a protection, you become mayor of the year, but after a storm, more than usual, uh, that whole place is destroyed. You try the sand uh, piling on the beach, but the sand piling disappears after just one year, even though it costs so much money. That's not to say these strategies can't be helpful. But according to Dr. Rignot, levees or sand piles get decimated when the next big storm hits and communities are back to square one. And these protections cost a lot too, which is why speaking economically, there may be merit to the idea that if people are going to have to move at some point, better sooner rather than later. It'll save them all the tax dollars that would have gone into protections that ultimately get destroyed. Obviously, that still doesn't address the fact that some people might not want to move, but at least on the money front, Dr. Rignot has a point. I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't have seen the economic calculation quite that way. But as much as ice sheet melting feels like an impossible problem to overcome, the good news is that we have time. Sea level rise is gradual, and we can adapt. And the faster we work on these solutions, the less we ultimately have to do, which is also exciting. Because if we can get our ice sheet melting under control, we'll limit sea level rise, help marine ecosystems, save a lot of money, and ensure that when kids in 50 years watch Happy Feet, the movie will hold up. Well, except for the pickup lines. Have you always wished you could live inside a dry ice freezer? If so, tundras are for you. With tundras, you get all the lack of water you crave without those pesky livable temperatures. Climate change is transitioning tundras into slightly warmer biomes, so time is running out on this incredible offer. Tundras. Even Elsa couldn't handle all that cold. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash peril and promise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Robin Bell, Professor of Marine Geology and Geophysics at Columbia University and recent president of the American Geophysical Union. Dr. Bell, welcome to the show. It's lovely to be here on The Sweaty Penguin. So you've done some really groundbreaking work on ice sheets. You've become one of the world's leading experts on the topic. You have a ridge in Antarctica named after you, which I think may be the ultimate goal in life. What got you interested in this field of research and what have been some of the highlights on your journey? As a little kid, I always like to look at things you couldn't just see when you were walking over them, like picking up the stones in the backyard to look at the ants. And so my first dream was to look underneath the oceans. And then I found that you could do the same thing that had led to so many discoveries in the oceans if you flew an airplane over the ice sheets and there were so much we didn't know about the ice sheets that that just launched my inherent curiosity and that little kidness, what's there? How does it work? I wanted to ask you about how they're changing because climate change has of course been a major driver of ice loss. And I think people might find it a little confusing that ice isn't really melting uniformly. We hear about 
West Antarctica being particularly vulnerable. We hear about the Arctic melting faster. Why would different regions be melting at different rates like this? Wow, there's so many ways to think about this. One is there's different kinds of ice. When you hear about the Arctic, you're often hearing about the ice floating on the ocean in the Arctic. And that's the difference between the Arctic and Antarctica. The Arctic's an ocean, so it's covered with a thin layer of ice. And that's very sensitive to sunlight and warming oceans because it's only, you know, maybe at most 10 feet thick. Whereas when you go to Antarctica, we're talking about ice that's miles thick and it's sitting on ground. So you can see something very different between whether the ice that floats on the ocean melts or whether ice that's two miles thick. So clearly in the last two decades, we've seen that Arctic ice melting and thinning. And that's when every September you hear we're at a minimum and you start to hear that ships are driving through the Northwest Passage because now they can. But that ice isn't going to change sea level because that ice is already floating in the global ocean. If we're worried about sea level changing, that's the ice that's sitting on land, either in Greenland or in Antarctica. So that's kinds of ice 101. Ice sheets versus ice that's floating in an ocean or called sea ice. The evidence for the ice sheets changing become so clear in the last 15 years. It used to be something when I first started studying ice sheets, no one thought the ice sheets could change really fast. Even in the 1990s, we were still really discouraged from saying that. But now we have the satellite record. And as I, I'll tell anybody this, you can ask me to talk about sunken ships in the Hudson River and I'll figure out how to work this into it. Because the evidence is so clear, we can measure how fast the ice is moving in these big rivers of ice that move out from the middle of the ice sheets. Those have doubled in speed in many places. So that's one measurement. And we can see that doubling or that speeding up both in Greenland and in Antarctica. Turns out ice is kind of like mozzarella cheese, you know, when you bite in a pizza and it stretches and thins. Well, when that ice speeds up, it's just like the mozzarella pizza. It's going to stretch and thin. So in the same places we see it speeding up, we make a second measurement. This is how high it is. And guess what? It's just like the pizza. It's getting thinner. So we see the elevation dropping in the same place. You've also discovered several large lakes locked beneath miles of ice. Could you share a bit about that process too? And if these lakes are significant at all from a climate perspective? Well, first of all, the question always comes out, why are there lakes underneath the ice sheet? And particularly if when you stand on top, it's minus 50 and you're thinking, how can there be a lake two miles below me? Well, it turns out that even though you're at minus 50 at the top, the ice gets warmer and warmer as you go down because of the heat of the earth coming up. It's kind of like how when you throw a comforter over you at, on a cold winter night, it stays warmer underneath the comforter than it is in your bedroom. So the ice is the comforter for the planet and it's warmer at the bottom. And about two miles down, you hit the melting point of ice. So that's how you can get melt at the bottom. Mostly the lakes form in places, the big lakes, like there's one that's the size of New Jersey called Lake Vostok, another one called 90 East, about half that size that are really deep. They're like a half mile deep. Those are way in the middle of the ice sheet and probably won't immediately have any impact on climate change. There are others that are around the edge that may modulate how the ice flows and where the water is matters for how fast ice will flow. So it's probably the smaller lakes and the lakes around the margins that matter for how ice flows in the long run. The great big ones are just these, they're probably 34 million years old, are just these amazing places on our planet. Yeah, it sounds really cool. It's unfortunate you probably can't go sleep there when you're studying on Antarctica. (laughs) So back in December, there were some big news stories about the discovery of cracks in the ice shelf holding back the Thwaites Glacier. It was sort of a worst case scenario come true. And I think a lot of people's reaction was, that's it, we failed on climate, we reached a tipping point. 
I was trying to remind people that climate change is here already. We're seeing its effects and we can't stop it, but we can certainly control it. We can curb the worst possible impacts. But what was your reaction to the new information on Thwaites? First of all, I think Aaron Petit and the team of scientists who did that have done a brilliant piece of work. It's something, you know, we predicted probably a decade ago was going to happen. The ice shelf has been looking like a bunch of chiclets for a while. So it's really hard to imagine that the chiclets are going to stick around very long. And really, my hope comes from we as a species, as we have this knowledge of how our planet works and everything from whether or not the land is bouncy because there's a volcano under there to how the ice is breaking in front, that knowledge is what's going to inform our future on this planet. And I'm not hopeless. I think that it is this global knowledge, this sharing of knowledge and this understanding that are showing that now is the moment to act and that we can act. And we're very fortunate as a species to have the knowledge to be able to move forward and build our sustainable future, something that's thriving and equitable for everybody. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's tough because a lot of people just see this as doom and gloom and might not even stop to think about how fortunate we are that scientists like yourself and your colleagues are able to discover these things and warn us of these things before they happen. So it's really, really great work that you all are doing. On the topic of tipping points, I'm just curious if you could speak to it a little bit more because I think it often comes up in the context of ice loss. And as much as I understand things like either sea level rise hitting a certain point, albedo hitting a certain point, it's also just hard to imagine one region having a spiral that affects the entire planet. So what do you make of tipping points? How much stock should we put in them? Well, I worry about talking about tipping points to the point that people decide, okay, we've passed it. I can no longer have to worry about it because we're doomed. And there is the tendency for press and the media to tell dram- dramatic stories. We have to remember we have not passed all the tipping points, that we have an opportunity now to act. And focusing on whether we're over any particular line is probably not what we should be doing. We should be focusing on how you, I, our communities, the places we work, and the governments who we live under, whether it's state, local, or whether it's in getting involved with the UN, how can we take this moment to foster the change that we need? to make sure that we don't see really unstoppable collapse. Absolutely. Very uh, well put. So where do you expect your research to go from here? What unanswered questions do you have about ice sheets? Oh, I have many unanswered questions about how ice sheets work. I'm very excited about a young woman scientist I work with is just in the process of launching a looking at rivers in northern Greenland and on the ice, on an ice shelf, and one that looks like it's an estuary. She discovered an estuary. And it's, again, these processes that we haven't considered before. So it's these questions about, yes, we've been able to see a lot with satellite imagery. And in fact, she discovered, we all carry an image of this estuary on our phone because it's what pops up on the Peterman ice shelf when you look at it on your iPhone, but nobody knew what it was. So to me, what excites me is there's so much left to be discovered about how the ice sheets work, how water flows over it, how cracks happen, how the ice and the ocean will interact, um, and even how it's constructed and how it flows into forms. So there's a lot left to be discovered and learned and eventually integrated into models of the future. If there were one thing that you wish either policymakers or the general public knew about ice sheets that they might not already, what would that be? What would your message be to us? My message would be that they're, they're a beautiful part of our planet and that our actions can ensure that they are preserved into the future. I love to tell people about 
the wow, there are lakes and water runs uphill and that all is not lost. I think that's what I really, my message to people is, is that now is the time for action, not for panic. Yeah, I appreciate that. I remember the Thwaites news stories. A lot of them use the term doomsday glacier. And even as someone versed on climate change, not well versed on ice and all that, but I was like, that doesn't sound like the right phrase. And I remember just feeling like, even if this is a tipping point, that doesn't preclude us from acting. We can still do something. Um, so right. I'm glad that you feel the same way. It's, you know, I used to, I have a Scientific American article I probably wrote uh, 10 or 15 years ago. I used to give it out all the time and I don't anymore. I used to explain how much ice was in each ice sheet by showing how you could drown different parts of Florida or how it, far it came up on the Tappan Zee Bridge. And one day I was doing one of these demonstrations and I looked down at a little, probably four-year-old boy and I was scaring the bejesus out of him. <laughs> I could just see it in his eyes. It's like, nope, that's it. Uh, this is not working because all I'm doing is paralyzing this little boy. We have to communicate differently. And it's challenging because doomsday and catastrophes make better headlines than we're just understanding things better. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on here and breaking down some of that nuance with us. So Dr. Bell, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure to spend time with you and take care. This wraps up episode 76 of The Sweaty Penguin. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. You get merch, bonus content, and more, including an extended cut of today's episode. Clips today came from WTHR, Ben Scallon, Tastemakers, Rutgers University, and Distinctive Voices. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownie Central. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week.